Welcome to the fifth session in our series on Rome Republic to Empire. This week I want to talk about the second of the great crises that attended the collapse of the Republic. And here, as the image on the cover slide, is an 18th century representation of the Sulla prescriptions. This was the first real civil blood that was ever shed in Roman politics. The massacres that attended the failure of the Gracchus reforms were nothing compared with this. And this is quite an interesting representation of the Sulla prescriptions. It was produced in France in 1799, and the man who produced this engraving and the people who looked at it had their own personal experience of a terror, of a large, organised massacre by their own state. So we look at this and say, oh, it's the Sulla prescriptions. People in France in 1799 looked at this and said, I know what that was like. So I think we should pay serious attention to this image, and I do give a full copy later on in the slides. Let me come to the general situation. The Republic, by about 100 BC, is unstable. You have endemic political instability within the Roman Republic. The ultimate cause of this is the changes in land ownership in Italy, which led to the growth of a gigantically enriched upper class and a progressively impoverished lower class. It doesn't, of course, help that Rome was now the mistress of the Mediterranean and a great tidal wave of gold is washing across the city in bribes from various eastern governments and in outright war booty. But the real problem is the matter of who owns the land in Italy. The Gracchus brothers had attempted a set of reforms which, if carried into effect, might have recreated a peasant freeholder class in Italy, and this might possibly have rebalanced the Republic. We can't say because we don't have full information about the situation in the Roman Republic at this time. We don't have full information about anything much before the middle of the 15th century, but we don't know what would have happened. It may be that the amount of money coming into Rome in bribes and booty would have entirely replaced the wealth drawn from the land. We can't say, but there is reason to believe, there is some reason to believe that the Gracchus reforms, if carried properly into effect, would at the very least have mitigated the political instability into which the Republic was drifting. However, these reforms were short-circuited, partly because the Gracchus brothers themselves did not behave with all the good sense that you might have hoped, but they were short-circuited. And what you have by about 100 BC is the emergence of two parties in Roman politics. The Optimates, the rich, a traditionalist grouping. It wants to limit the power of the popular assemblies. It wants to limit the power of the tribunes. It wants to extend the power of the Senate. It is dedicated to preserving the nice position enjoyed by the possessing classes in Italy. On the other side, you have the Populares, that is a much more radical grouping, which wants to expand the power of the popular assemblies to turn Rome into a much more democratic kind of place. It also wants to extend the power of the tribunes and to limit the power of the Senate, and this will enable the redistribution of land that the Gracchus brothers tried to achieve and that people dreamed about after their failure. So you have two parties, two political parties, which have diametrically opposed aims for the future of the Roman Republic. Now, both claim constitutional and historical legitimacy, 
Both can point to precedents in Roman history in which these things had been achieved or successfully resisted. Both also agree that the empire is the property of the Roman people, and the only question is over the distribution of the loot from the empire. The popular party did not believe in universal human rights. What else I would emphasize is that this was not a vertical split in Roman politics. It is not the case of an upper class opposed to a lower class. Both parties had large popular support in both Rome and Italy, and both parties were led by traditional aristocrats. So the situation is rather complex. It's complex in ways that we don't fully understand. How is it that the optimates did, for the most part, have so much support? It may be the practice of clientage. It may be outright bribery, but bribery and a bit of social pressure are not enough to keep winning elections, which these people on the whole managed to do. However, after the death of the Gracchus brothers, Rome went through a period of about 20 years where there were no very great political leaders. And when you have an absence of great political leaders, it is unlikely that there will be great political upheavals all we can say is that during the 20-year period after the failure of the Gracchus brothers and their reforms, there was a generation of uneasy peace. The streets of Rome were increasingly dangerous, elections were increasingly violent and corrupt, but nobody stepped in to this growing instability with any suggestions for making things worse as a means of finally making them better. And so Rome is in an uneasy stalemate between these two parties. This stalemate was broken, as is often the case, by foreign developments. And the most important of these foreign developments in the first instance was the war in North Africa. This has a rather complex backstory. After the destruction of the Carthaginian Empire, after the loss by Hannibal of the Second Punic War, Carthage was given a small piece of land in North Africa. And looking on this map, if you look at the green area, that is the Kingdom of Numidia. It is ruled by a local governing class. It is an entirely native government, but it is a Roman satellite. The kings of Numidia do as the Romans tell, and after the final destruction of Carthage in 146 BC, Carthaginian territory is replaced by that white area, the province of Africa. But Roman domination of North Africa does not stop at the borders of that white area. It covers the whole of the white and the green areas. However, internal developments in Numidia bring about a war between Numidia and Rome. And the man responsible for this is Jugurtha. He was one of the sons of a king of Numidia. And when the old king died, he divided his kingdom between his three sons, Adherbal, Hiempsal, and Jugurtha. And Jugurtha was not his son, he was an adopted son, but he was a man of considerable ability and ambition. He immediately turned on his two adoptive brothers and eventually killed both of them. But one of them, and Herbal escaped to Rome and asked the Senate for justice. Jugurtha, who had control of the whole of Numidia now, managed to extract enough money from his subjects in taxes to bribe the Senate into taking his side. So the Senate divided Numidia into two parts, one ruled by Adherbal, the other by Jugurtha. 
this situation continued for a few years until Jugurtha decided to take over the whole of Numidia. And so he started a war and he beat his brother. Finally, he besieged his brother in the town of Kirita, where there were thousands of Roman and Italian merchants. At this point, Jugurtha was called to Rome to explain himself. Things begin to drift out of control at this point. Adherbal surrendered to Jugurtha, believing that the Senate would ensure that there was some kind of stability. But Jugurtha simply got hold of his adopted brother, had him tortured horribly to death, and then he massacred the entire population of Kerta, including the whole of the Italian mercantile community. And this was probably too much even for a very corrupt Roman Senate. In it, it was too much for the Senate. The Senate declared war on Jugurtha and sent one of the consuls to defeat him. But the consul simply accepted large bribes from Jugurtha. Nothing was achieved in the war. The consul was charged with corruption on his return to Rome. Jugurtha was summoned to Rome to testify in the trial, but he bribed a tribune. Remember, tribunes had the power to stop any proceedings on the grounds that they were not in the interests of the Roman people. If one of the tribunes is bribed, he can simply stop a law case, and that is what happened. Jugurtha then had one of his political enemies murdered in the middle of Rome. That was certainly too much for the Senate. He was ordered to leave the city. But before he left, he made this famous comment. Now that's a city available for a price, and it will fall soon enough once it finds a buyer. Jugurtha said that in Rome everything was for sale, and he was broadly right. The war dragged on for year after year with no particular success, because Jugurtha was rich, Jugurtha was clever, it was a large area, the small Roman armies sent out to put down his war with Rome were inadequate for the task, they were badly led, and again Jugurtha was bribing them. This finally brought on a political crisis which had been avoided for the previous 20 years. As I said, there had been no great men in Rome, but this war, which was not a matter of existential importance for Rome, but it was a big war, it was an embarrassing war as well, this war led to the emergence of one of the great men in Roman politics, a man called Gaius Marius, a man who came from a moderately wealthy family, but not one of the super-rich, historic, noble families of Rome, he was the first man in his family to be elected consul. He got himself elected consul by promising the electors, if you make me one of the consuls, I will finish this war in North Africa. And that's what he did. He got himself elected consul, took control of a large Roman army, went back to Africa. He finished the war in two years. He captured Jugurtha. He celebrated a large triumph in Rome, at the end of which, according to ancient custom, Jugurtha was deposited in the temple of Hercules to be ritually strangled, one of the less pleasant features of Roman military policy. And then, because Africa was still unsettled, Marius got himself re-elected as consul, and he got himself re-elected as consul in absentia. He wasn't even in the city to do the canvassing. It was an irregular election, but it was not actually illegal. And there were very good reasons why most people agreed that Marius should be re-elected consul, not once, but again and again, year after year. You see, Marius very quickly proved himself to be the greatest military leader of his age, and Rome needed him not just to put down the war in North Africa, but to deal with another war which was of existential importance not only to Rome but to the whole of Mediterranean civilization. But that is moving on slightly.
This is what Marius had to say about the Roman aristocracy. Their ancestors left them all the things they could leave them, such as wealth, wax masks, the memory of their brilliant deeds. They didn't leave them manliness, though, and they couldn't. They think I'm uncouth and trashy because I don't give an elegant enough dinner, but work is a man's job, and having a good reputation is worth more than money, and one gets glory not with household objects but with weapons. A rather rough and ready man, you can see. Here is the existential threat. This is a map of the Eurasian landmass seen from an unusual perspective. Imagine that you are part of a nation of hunter-gatherers living in the far north. Mostly, you travel around the same lands, hunting and trapping, picking things, living out your life. But every so often, the weather turns bad, or rather, the climate turns down. It gets colder. And then you find that your traditional hunting grounds are not sufficient to support you in the lifestyle to which you are traditionally accustomed and then you start to listen with a great deal more interest to those stories of a warm sea far to the south where there's wine and olive oil and bread and the people live in cities filled with precious objects and the men are rather soft and the women are pretty. So you get your covered wagons ready and you start rolling south across this landmass. And as you go, you crash into other peoples who are in much the same position as you, but perhaps not quite so uncomfortable. You fight and you conquer these people, or you simply join forces with them, and you continue southward, ever southward, towards the shores of the Mediterranean with an accumulating mass of people until you reach the two great rivers that separate Europe from north to south, the Rhine and the Danube. In those days, these rivers were unfortified, so you get across them and continue southward into the Balkan Peninsula or into Italy or into Gaul. There you hope to make a new home for yourself. And this is roughly what happened around 100 BC. There was a movement of the northern peoples into central and then into southern Europe. In the first instance, they invaded Gaul or France and then Spain, not exactly crashing into the Roman Republic. They mostly keep away from the Roman spheres of influence, but eventually there are so many of them and they are so bold that they take on a Roman army and they defeat it. And then Italy itself is open to invasion. Marius has made a very good name for himself in Africa, fighting a war which I'll repeat was embarrassing but not of existential importance for the Roman Republic, certainly not for Mediterranean civilization as a whole, but these barbarian invasions are a matter of existential importance. They are on the same scale as the famous barbarian invasions of the 4th and 5th centuries AD. And this time, the Rhine and the Danube are not fortified. The barbarians stream straight across into southern Europe. So Marius is sent against them. However, in order for Marius to fight an effective war against this large-scale barbarian threat, it's necessary to let him reform the Roman army. Traditionally, the Roman army has been a citizen militia. It has been the right and the duty of Roman citizens to serve in the armed forces, not all Roman citizens, in order to fight in the army, there is a property requirement. You need to be a freeholder. You need to be able to afford your own weapons, your armor, your weapons, your horses. You need to be able to arm yourself. You also need to be able to go away on long periods of service while your family at home is able to look after itself. 
With the decline of the freeholder class in Italy, the number of recruits for this citizen militia are beginning to fall, and there is a sudden need for a large Roman army. So Marius, for the purpose of fighting the African campaign in the first instance, gets an exemption from these laws, and he's able to raise a large army for his war against Jugurtha without regard to property qualification. As soon as the German barbarians come into sight, Marius gets this temporary exemption made permanent. He also begins to recruit non-Roman citizens into the army, in the first instance, these are Italians, they speak Latin, they look like Romans, and there's no particular difficulties. But the promise held out to these new recruits is that if you serve in the Roman army, when you eventually get your release, you will become Roman citizens and you'll get a small piece of land, you'll get a farm out of this. This allows Marius to raise a large army. It's the open recruitment of the poor with a salary and with weapons and armour provided by the Roman state and the promise of a pension and the promise of a small piece of land and, of course, if you're not a citizen, the promise of citizenship. This solves the recruitment problem. It is now possible once again to start recruiting very large Roman armies. However, these are different Roman armies from the past the new armies have no particular loyalty to the Roman state. Their loyalty is to their general, to the man who leads them, the man who will lead them to victory when they'll be able to enrich themselves with booty from the conquered peoples. And they look to their general to make sure that the promises held out to them of Roman citizenship and certainly of pensions and land allotments will be followed through by the Roman state. They no longer look to the Roman state as their ultimate employer. Their focus of loyalty is not to the Roman state, their focus of loyalty is to the general. They look to him to see them right. At first, all goes very well. Here is a map showing the movement of the barbarian peoples. It's a rather complex route, starting out in Jutland, though really starting further north and further to the east. But you'll see that they cross the Rhine and Danube and they wander around Gaul and Spain, causing a great deal of trouble. And then they break into Roman territory. At first, the Romans are not prepared for them and the Roman armies are defeated. But then Marius wins a series of catastrophic victories, or rather he wins a series of victories against the barbarians which are catastrophic for those barbarians. He kills hundreds of thousands in battle. He takes hundreds of thousands as slaves, which then swell those slave markets. The survivors are driven north of the Rhine and Danube, and they don't come back for another 500 years. It was a great achievement. And after this, Marius was regarded as the third founder of Rome, after Romulus, who built Rome, and Brutus, who established the Republic, there is Marius, who saved Rome from these early barbarian invasions. Marius has enormous prestige, but he has limited interest in politics. Even so, he did put his foot down with the Senate, and he insisted that his men should be given their promised grants of land and their pensions. After this, he goes into semi-retirement, but his own personal preference in politics is for the popular party. Oh, yeah, there's an alliteration. He's not willing to take an active role in Roman politics, but generally speaking, he supports the popular party. And why not? He's not himself an aristocrat, He's not himself a gigantically rich landowner. He has been the head 
of large Roman armies recruited from the Roman poor, he has a certain sympathy with the interests of his men. No trouble at the moment, however. You then have the emergence of another great man in Roman politics, two of them coming out at the same time. Lucius Cornelius Sulla, 138 BC to 78 BC, charming, vindictive, brilliant, ruthless, brutal. You can say all sorts of things about Sulla, not all of them to his credit, but you can certainly say many things about him. He is from the old aristocracy, though he's born into a rather impoverished branch of the old aristocracy. But his immense abilities soon make sure that he emerges as a great man in Roman politics. His first role is as one of the deputies of Marius in North Africa. They worked together very well to beat Jugurtha and to bring the African war to a very successful end. Then Sulla turns up again in Rome, and he is ideologically committed to the optimates. Sulla realises what needs to be done to re-stabilise Roman politics. It is necessary to limit the powers of the popular assemblies, and perhaps even to limit the powers of the tribunes, and to make sure that the main balance of power in the Roman constitution moves into the hands of the Senate. He is clever enough and ruthless enough to understand that this is what his side needs to do, and to do it. And it's now that rivalry emerges between him and Marius. Marius is drawn back into Roman politics because of the rise of Sulla as the leader of the Optimates party. It remains a matter of electoral competition until foreign affairs once more take a hand in Roman politics. And this is in 88 BC, when a great revolt breaks out in the eastern Mediterranean. Here is King Mithridates of Pontus, which is a Roman client state in Asia. If you look on the map in the bottom right of the slide, the very dark purple areas are the original territory of Pontus. It is, as I said, a client state. It's not ruled directly by Rome, but it is dominated by Rome and its external and internal policies are largely dictated by Rome until Mithridates comes along and he sees an opportunity to build himself a great empire. He isn't a Greek, though he speaks Greek, but he sees himself possibly as another Alexander or at the very least, as another of those great Hellenistic god-kings. If you look at this image of him on the left, you'll see that he is clothed in the garment of one of the Hellenistic god-kings, a lion skin, and although the gilding has gone, his eyes would have been cast upwards to heaven in the style of those Hellenistic kings. He sees an opportunity and the opportunity comes about because Roman government in the eastern Mediterranean, which in the first instance had been welcomed by ordinary people because the Romans were straight, the Romans were honest, the Romans gave firm and cheap government. This government has become increasingly corrupt and predatory, and now the Romans are seen as a kind of vampire with its teeth clamped into the jugular of the eastern provinces. There is a great deal of discontent at Roman rule, and Mithridates sees his opportunity. He will present himself as the liberator of the Greeks. In order to make sure that the Greeks are irrevocably on his side, he adopts an idea which was proposed to him by a philosopher called Metrodorus of Skepsis. 
This is to arrange a massacre all on one day of all the Romans in the East. This is what he does. In May 88 BC, there was a coordinated massacre of all the Romans and the Italians in Asia, at least 80,000 people rounded up and slaughtered. This is something that the Roman state cannot overlook, and it binds the Greeks into the cause of Mithridates. Either they support him and follow him and fight by his side, or they allow the Romans to come out and to inflict a number of horrible reprisals. And immediately the whole of this purple area on the map, the territory of modern Turkey, rises up, throws off Roman government, and becomes part of the larger empire of Mithridates. This is a first-class military challenge to Rome. It's necessary for the Roman state to take immediate action. And immediately in Roman politics, the question comes up of who is going to lead the Roman armies of reconquest in the east. Sulla is young, and he is one of the consuls for the year, so he has a first-class claim to lead the army of reconquest. But Marius, of course, is the greatest general that Rome has produced in a hundred years, Although he's now rather elderly, why not Marius? He is a known force. Everyone agrees that he will be able to defeat Mithridates, but he isn't the consul. Sulla is the consul. Whatever the case, Rome needs a military champion again, and it has two of them. It's just that they're not willing to work together. The Romans must choose one or the other. Now, in 87 BC, Sulla left Rome for the east at the head of his army. The moment he was out of the city, Marius and his supporters called a meeting of the assembly, and they reversed the senatorial grant of power to Sulla. I don't know what they expected, but I don't think they expected what did happen, which is that Sulla was in southern Italy, getting his soldiers across the Adriatic into Greece. News came to Sulla that his grant of authority had been revoked. He didn't hurry back to Rome to argue his case. He marched on Rome with five legions, all of them personally loyal to him. He broke into the city. The defence that Marius organised was inadequate, and it was overwhelmed. Marius then ran off to North Africa, and here is an 18th century French representation of Marius taking refuge in the ruins of Carthage, which may represent roughly what happened, but that's not terribly important. What does matter is that Sulla turns up in Rome at the head of an army, the first time this has ever happened. He marches in, and he establishes he re-establishes order, and he sets about reforming the Roman constitution in the ways that he has long planned. He strengthens the Senate by removing the right of the Assembly to make laws. The Assembly can now vote for or against laws which are proposed by the Senate. There is no longer any autonomous right of the assembly to propose laws, and the tribunes no longer have the power to propose laws. Sulla has now rebalanced the Roman constitution as he thinks, the city is at peace, and so he sets out again for the east. What he does in the east is remarkable. He arrives in mainland Greece in 87, the Greek city-states, which had declared for Mithridates, Corinth, Thebes, and so on, they take one look at this large Roman army, they get cold feet, and they immediately surrender to Sulla. We're very sorry, we didn't mean to do this, we had no choice, but now that you're here to protect us, please be aware that we have always been loyal to the Roman Republic, we've always been friends of Rome, and that is what we always shall be. 
The only main Greek city-state which refused to surrender to Sulla was Athens, which was ruled by a rather strange philosopher called Aristion. Stories of tyranny and cannibalism, which may be true, but it's very hard to say, but he refuses to subject Athens to Rome again. He holds out. He believes that Athens is sufficiently well defended to hold out indefinitely, in which case he's a fool, but that's what he thought. Sulla and his Roman army lay siege to Athens. They cut off the road that leads from Athens to the port of Piraeus, and Athens is starved into submission. There are two stories about the end of the siege of Athens. Both of them agree that the Romans won. But the two stories are, Sulla takes Athens and he allows a massacre of the population and mass pillage. He drags Aristion and his supporters from where they've taken refuge inside the Parthenon and puts them to death in public. That is one story. The other story which is rather more entertaining, is that eventually the Romans make a breach in the Athenian walls. At this point, the city council of Athens all streams out into Sulla's camp and beg him, we want to surrender, please don't do anything unpleasant to us. If that is what happened, they surely understood the rules of ancient warfare, and the rules were these, the agreed rules, until deep into the 18th century. I think they were the rules into the 19th century, though no one strictly insisted on them. The rules were this. If an army turns up and knocks on the gates of a city, the city has an opportunity to surrender. If the city surrenders, the lives and property of the people in that city are sacrosanct. If the city closes its gates and keeps them closed, an army may besiege the city. At any time thereafter, there may be a peace by negotiation. It may be the city is hard to take, or the city is in a weak position. Whatever the case, there is a conference, and the besieging army and the defenders inside the walls make an agreement of whatever kind. It may be Yes, we will surrender, but you must treat us as if we had surrendered at the outset. Or it may be, we will surrender and pay you a huge amount of money, but otherwise you'll leave us alone. But once the walls were breached and the army was inside the walls, all deals were off, and you would have three days of looting and massacre in which the conquering army could do whatever it liked, at the end of which time the city was defeated and it would do as it was told, or at least the survivors would do as they were told. Now the Romans are inside the walls and they've started the massacre, but the town council throws itself at Sulla's feet, begging, please, please, don't do anything horrible to us. Sulla laughed at them, saying, sorry, it's far too late for that, my men deserve their fun. You should have come to me yesterday or the day before. Don't come to me now. But you see, large numbers of the Roman upper class by now have studied in Athens. These people are civilized. They are Hellenized. They are under the spell of Greek civilization. And they start pulling at Sulla's sleeve, saying, you're not going to burn Athens. You don't really mean to go through with this, do you? And then the town councillors stood up and they pointed shaking fingers up at the Acropolis, at the Parthenon and the Erechtheion and the great complex of temples. Sulla's staff officers become more insistent in begging him not to go through with the total destruction of Athens. So at last Sulla says, all right, I will spare the living for the sake of the dead. I think nothing of the Athenian people as they are, but I am aware of what they were, and because of what they were, I will not subject them to the usual rules of warfare. He issues orders for the massacre to be called off, and for Athens to be treated in a much more respectable manner, and then walks rather grumpily back into his tent. 
That's another version of the story, and it's the one I prefer. Whatever the case, Sulla put down the Greek revolt in mainland Greece and then travelled across into Asia, defeated Mithridates in a series of large battles. He didn't destroy Mithridates. Mithridates was allowed to withdraw from these defeats with his army still in good order because Sulla now has his eye on developments in Rome. Even as he's laying siege to Athens, and even as after he's taken Athens, he goes across from Europe into Asia to sort out Mithridates directly. There are stories coming back from Rome of what's going on there, and of the terrible things that Marius is doing now he's returned from North Africa, Sulla is interested in finishing his war in Asia as quickly as possible and getting himself and his large and victorious army back to Rome. Because of this, he sits down with Mithridates and grants him a much more generous peace than anybody had thought would be the case. Mithridates realises that he can't beat Sulla if he keeps the war going, he will suffer a total defeat. But Sulla isn't interested in inflicting that total defeat. What Sulla wants is a quick deal in which Mithridates will withdraw from the Roman provinces that he's occupied, and Sulla can announce that he's won the war, and then he can get himself back to Rome. And that is what happens it looks as though Sulla's won. He has won. He's defeated Mithridates in battle. Mithridates is forced to vacate all of his conquests in Asia. But Mithridates remains a force in being, ready to renew his war with Rome at any time in the future that may be convenient. But for the moment, the war is over. As soon as there is a peace agreement... Sulla heads back to Rome. And if the last time he turned up in Rome at the head of an army, he did not behave in a very pleasant way, he is now committed to behaving in a far less pleasant way. Because back in Rome, Sulla's reforms of the constitution have all been undone. As soon as Sulla was out of Italy and committed in the east, Marius turned up in Rome at the head of his own army. The Senate had no choice but to give in to him. So Marius enters Rome with his colleague Cinna. Cinna has promised moderation. He's made a deal with the Senate saying, well, we'll come in and we will start to make our popular reforms. But we're not going to do anything terribly unpleasant. There'll be no violence, no bloodshed. It will be a constitutional rebalancing again. But you see, although Sinner has made these promises, Marius hasn't, and he doesn't feel bound by these promises. So his first act on arriving in Rome is to oversee a massacre of everyone who had supported Sulla. Indeed, Sulla's colleague in the consulship was dragged from his chair of office in Rome and beheaded. Slaves, remember slaves, they've been promised their freedom if they will join in the killing. And this runs out of control into an orgy of bloodshed, which only stops when Marius realises that things have gone seriously out of control and it's not in his interest to have these slaves running around the city murdering people. So Marius turns his army on the slaves, has a number of them crucified, and that is the end of the massacre. But after this, you have a rigged election in which Marius and Cinna are both elected consul, and it looks as though the popular party has won. It looks as though the Gracchus revolution can now go ahead. But in January 86 BC, Marius dies suddenly. He's a few days into his seventh consulship, which is a record in Roman politics. Marius, the great leader of the Popular Party, has unexpectedly died, and Sulla 
is now hurrying back to Rome at the head of a very large and victorious and totally loyal army. The Marius army reforms have now brought about this situation in which armies are not loyal to the Roman state, they are loyal to the general who has led them to victory, who has enriched them with booty, and who will, if he continues to be successful, give them their grants of land and their grants of Roman citizenship for those who are not citizens. Sulla arrives in Rome in November 82 BC. The question is, what is he going to do? The popular party sends out an army, an army that it's pulled together from the poor of Rome, but this is defeated outside the walls of Rome, 50,000 casualties. Sulla marches into Rome, and immediately the senators who survived the massacres appoint him dictator for the making of laws and for the settling of the constitution. This is supposed to be for six months, that's what the constitution says, but the Senate does not specify any limit of time. Sulla appears to have been made dictator for life. So what is Sulla going to do? Here's what Plutarch says a few hundred years later in his biography of Sulla. Sulla immediately prescribed 80 persons without communicating with any magistrate. That is, he sentenced 80 people to death without trial. Indeed, his way of sentencing people to death was to put up a list of their names in the forum with a bounty on their heads. Here is a list of people whom I want dead. Anyone who brings me in the head of this person will receive a share of his estate. In any event, his estate will be confiscated. So Sulla prescribed 80 persons without communicating with any magistrate. As this caused a general murmur, he let one day pass and then prescribed 220 more, and again on the third day as many. In a speech to the people, he said with reference to these measures that he had prescribed all he could think of, and as to those who now escaped his memory, he would prescribe them at some future time. Apparently, he eventually prescribed 9,000 people, and this involved daily lists of names in the forum with bounties on their heads and confiscation of their property. The money was used to enrich Sulla and his friends, and it was also used to pay off his loyal soldiers. This was a precedent for all future seizures of power in Rome. And here on the right of the slide is a representation from 1912 of the prescriptions. You can see the list of names put up in the forum, and in the foreground you can see an old man He's obviously seen his name on the list, and there is no alternative for him but to go home, get into a bath, and open his veins, because that will at least give him a dignified death by his own hand, rather than being dragged through the streets and then beheaded. Now, a massacre of 9,000 people, by 20th century standards, isn't that many but it is the first regular proscription of political enemies in Roman history. It doesn't rank beside the informal massacres carried out at the end of the attempted Gracchus reforms. Those were street battles, and people died in the street fighting. These are formal acts of the Roman government. A list is put up every day in the forum, those people listed are to be killed. No questions asked, they are to be killed, and the killers are to be given a share of the confiscated property. There is a full copy of that 1799 French print. And as I said at the beginning, this is something that most people in 1799 would have recognised. It would have been something that they themselves had lived through. 
in the Great Terror of 1792 and 1793. It all looks rather stagey to us, but it would have had significant meaning to people at the time. And this is surely a reasonable representation of what those prescriptions looked like. You can say that this was a very wicked thing to do. We can all agree violence never solves any problem. But the truth is, if it is directed intelligently and if it is applied in limited doses, violence does solve problems. That is what Sulla set out to do. The idea was to decapitate the popular party. You make up a list of those people who are involved in the popular party or those people who might become involved in the popular party and you kill them, you remove them from politics. And in that way, you will establish a generation of peace because there will be nobody around who is able to challenge whatever settlement you make. It is, of course, a very wicked thing to do. And for the record, it's not something that I would want to do or be involved with. But one of the reasons why political violence has been so popular throughout history is not because people are necessarily bloodthirsty sadists, though of course there is a fair bit of that, but because political violence does often work. And Sulla was a remarkably successful Roman politician in this age. But before we come to his reforms, there is our first view of the next great man in Roman politics. There is Julius Caesar. This is an image of him made somewhat later in life. He first appears in Roman politics at the age of 16. He is related by marriage to Marius. One of his aunts was married to Marius. And Caesar was committed to the popular party. He was only 16 when Sulla turned up in Rome, but he made some trouble for Sulla. In particular, he refused to divorce his wife, who was the daughter of Cinna, Marius's colleague in the consulship. Sulla was angry that this young man had disobeyed his clear instructions, so Caesar's name was added to one of the lists of the prescribed and Caesar had to go into hiding for a while. He was eventually found and taken back to Rome where he was to be put to death. At this point, Caesar's various friends and relatives, who were also friends and relatives of Sulla because the Roman upper class was very heavily networked by intermarriage, went to Sulla and said, you're not going to kill him, are you? He's 16. That's far too young to murder him. You can't kill him. He's my nephew. He's my cousin. He's a good friend of my son, or what have you. Sulla, at last, as was the case with Athens, allowed his better nature to get the better of him, shall we say. And he said, all right, I'll spare this young man, but I do assure you, I do see many Mariuses in this young man. If you let him live, he'll grow into someone who is an even bigger challenge to our power than Marius was. But Sulla spared Caesar, and Caesar was allowed to lie low while Sulla was alive, and thereafter to set about the slow work of building his own political base. Let's come back to what Sulla did. Once Sulla had murdered all his opponents and there was no one to speak against him, he set about some fundamental revisions to the Roman constitution. And here is my map of the Roman constitution. Remember that traditionally the Senate did not make laws. The Senate had the right to suggest laws to the assembly, which the assembly had the right to reject or to accept, but the assembly itself could propose laws, and the tribunes elected every year could also propose laws. 
Sulla's reforms to the constitution ended the right of the assembly to propose any laws. He also stopped the tribunes from proposing laws. Sulla also made further changes to the office of tribune. They didn't lose their immunity. The number of tribunes wasn't cut down. But what had happened for the previous few hundred years was that a man could stand for tribune, get himself elected, and then if he did a decent job, he could use that as the base from which he would reach out and attempt a consulship, or he would attempt one of the other elective offices, which would eventually allow him to join the Senate. Sulla brought in a law that meant that if someone was elected tribune, then he was automatically disqualified from standing for election as consul or any of the other senior magistracies. So you could become a tribune and you had the power to veto legislation and veto decisions of the Senate and what have you, but this would not be the beginning of a glorious political career. It would be one year of power followed by disqualification for life from any other office. The purpose of this was to make sure that the tribunate became a rather minor office in Rome. Nobody of any ability from now on would want to become a tribune. There'd be no more Gracchus brothers putting themselves up as tribunes. It would be people of low quality with limited ambition. They would serve out their term as tribune and then they would spend the rest of their lives unable to progress any further. Quite a clever reform to the tribunate. You don't abolish it, you simply decapitate it. So these were the reforms that Sulla made to the Roman constitution. He also expanded the Senate. He expanded it from about 300 to 600, and most of the new senators he appointed were from outside Rome. They were Italians, people who had recently gained Roman citizenship in the laws that extended citizenship throughout Italy. This seems to have been part of an effort to create a unified ruling class for the whole of Italy. No longer would you have landowners who were Roman citizens and landowners who were not Roman citizens. Instead, there would be a single landowning class in Italy, and these people would have a single set of interests, and they would work together to protect those interests. While he was dictator, Sulla killed at least 9,000 people. Mostly the people he murdered were his actual or potential political rivals, but there was also a degree of randomness about the slaughters, and Plutarch says, at the slightest pretext he might have a man crucified, but on another occasion would make light of the most appalling crimes, or he might happily forgive the most unpardonable offences and then punish trivial, insignificant misdemeanours with death and confiscation of property. So Sulla is Rome's first violent dictator who takes power in a military coup. He's not the last, but he's the first. But unlike all his successors, Sulla was a man of limited ambition. In 79 BC, having achieved all of his political objectives, he disbanded his army and re-establishes the normal constitutional government of the Republic. He then retires to a villa outside Rome to write his memoirs, where he spent every day in wild sexual and drunken debauches. And the stories of his death are again various. One is that he drank himself to death, which is the most likely as far as I can see. There is another story, which I'll allow you to read for yourself from Plutarch, about he picked up some bizarre infection in which small insects, 
took up residence inside his body and were able to poke themselves out through his skin. And hundreds and thousands of these small creatures would pour out of his body all day, every day, no matter how often he took a bath, no matter what medical attention he received, these creatures continued popping out through his skin until they wore his constitution down and he died in considerable pain. Now, modern doctors often say there is no disease that can do this, but there are a number of well-attested stories of people in the past who died of this disease. Sulla, Herod the Great, Philip II of Spain. The historians can't all be wrong about this. The doctors are unanimous that no such medical condition exists, and they don't see how any such medical condition can exist. But the stories are emphatic and quite frequent of this condition. Whatever the case, Sulla died, and that is the end of the First Civil War. Rome returns to normal constitutional rule, or at least it returns to government under the revised constitution that Sulla has given it. And Rome now remains at peace for another 15 years. The reason it remains at peace is that everybody who might be inclined to challenge the new settlement has been murdered. You may think that during these upheavals, Rome ceases to expand its empire, but there is no truth in that. The empire continues to expand, taking in more and more new territories. The empire by 70 BC is bigger than it has ever been, and there seems to be no limit to the scope of Roman expansion. So what you have is a dying constitution at home, but an expanding empire abroad. And now for the first time, the expanding empire has turned back and hit at Rome directly. Events within the empire outside Italy now have a direct and large-scale impact on Roman politics. And this is something that will continue. Now, next week, I want to talk about the rise of Julius Caesar and the last period of Republican politics. It's difficult to say when the Republic does come to an end, but sometime around 65 BC does appear to be a reasonable date, but we'll discuss that next week. Now, again, I take you up to the limit, so can we hold over questions to next week? I suppose the overall message is that political violence can work for short periods. What it achieves in the longer term is another matter, so was that all right?